That was amazing, wasn't it? Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining us this morning here at Grace Online, I guess that's what we're calling it in this crazy, wacky world that we're living in. But thank you for joining us, whether it's Facebook, whether it's our web uh, site, whether it's our app. Um, can I say this with, with our worship team as I'm sitting here in this place? We miss worshiping with you. I miss it. I miss it. And so thank you for joining us this morning in this odd world of upside down. Uh, you know, I've noticed so many different things happening. Um, maybe you have as well. Uh, I'm Pastor Reuben. I'm the pastor of student ministries here at Grace. And one of the worlds I'm in is with youth, obviously. And I've noticed not a lot of people out there making fun of homeschoolers anymore. I think that's, you know, <laughs> I think we've all come to grips with, well, maybe that's not what I thought it was, right? I never thought I would see the day where I would seriously consider moving my financial investments into a company called Charmin. I, I, <laughs> I never would have thought that. But these are interesting times, aren't they? And so, listen, we want to make sure that you understand that we are happy to be able to worship with you this morning. And so thank you for joining us. And we've said this a couple of times, but I want to say it again. Please, d d share this with your friends. This is a great time. As crazy as it is, it's also an opportune time to, man, share this with your friends. Share the gospel with your friends, the good news of Christ in a way that maybe they would never come and worship with us, but they'll worship in your living room. Maybe they'll worship in their living room. Share it with them. So again, we thank you for joining us this morning. We are in a, uh, the second part of a three-part series or a four-part series called The Substitute. And my charge this morning was to bring you the second part of it. And, and, and I just want to start with a question. What memories do you have of the table? And when I say the table, I, I, in my mind, it com what comes to mind is my dining room table. I grew up in a, in a southern household. Well, at least my mom was. I, I was a Yankee, okay? Um, my, my father was a Yankee, and, but my mom was from the south. And, and so most of our life congregated around this dining room table. Maybe that's the same as yours. What, what are your memories? Maybe it's deliciously home-cooked meals. Maybe it's game night. I, I don't know about you, but we've been playing lots of games at my house, uh, sometimes too many. Um, <laughs> but maybe it's gathering with friends. Maybe it's gathering with family that you don't want to gather with at times. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's gathering with loved ones. Maybe it's even a place of creation. Maybe your table right now looks like um, a craft room. Maybe it's full of, uh, you know, all kinds of assortments of things that I would walk in and have no idea what to do with. I'm not crafty at all. <laughs> Maybe your place is maybe that of Kenny's. We were talking today and we see his house and it's loaded with musical instruments. Maybe your table involves that. What memories do you have of your table it's a piece of furniture that's important, and, and this is not something that's new. In fact, it's so important in my home that my wife has recently, um, you know, in the last month and a half, she decided, um, I believe she described it as family fun time, where we were going to move half the furniture in our house um, to accommodate making our dining room table the center of our home. Why? Why? Because so much happens at the table. Again, this is a tradition that goes back thousands and thousands of years. And it's one that I want to talk about today. It was not unnew in the times of Christ. His ministry, in fact, revolved around a table. Huge moments 
in Scripture have utilized the table. And that brings us today. And, 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 and I want to read a passage today that what has kind of been come to known as the Last Supper of Jesus Christ. And this is so prominent. In fact, whether you are a Christian or not, you've probably seen paintings or sculptures. You've maybe even heard songs written about these kind of endeavors. But this was a massive moment that has been recorded in history. So let's do a little backstory on this moment, this important moment at this table. Christ has gathered his disciples together to have this Passover feast. And what you need to understand is the Passover feast was a remembrance. If you look at the table here, you'll see, if you can't see it, it says this do in remembrance of me. We'll come back to that later. But it was a remembrance of a time period known in Jewish history as the Exodus. This was a celebration of God leading the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land. And there were 10 plagues involved in that. And the last plague was the worst. In fact, it was a plague that would take the firstborn son. But in God's glory, he said, listen, if you take the blood of a lamb and you paint it across your doorpost, uh, what is known or come to be known as the angel of death would pass over your home, and your son would be spared. So this feast marks that time, and it was a command given by God to remember. Remember. Sometimes we're not good at that, are we? And so this morning, let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 22, where this passage is found, and let's remember. The setting is Jesus has invited his disciples to eat this last supper, this last Passover at the table with him. And he delivers a kind of speech that actually would be quite typical of this kind of banquet, but let me get you to understand something. This was no typical speech. So let's look together, can we? In Luke chapter 22, verse 14, and when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, listen to this, there's a transition here. We'll, we'll unpack this in a second. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man whom he has betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it would be that would do this. This morning, I, I want to start by focusing on verse 15, because it, man, it, it enraptured me as I studied this message, as I studied it uh, in, 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 in the Greek language and, and what Christ meant here, commentaries, and, and it just hit me at the heart. And verse 15 says this, and he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. These words, earnestly desired, they stem from this Greek word, uh, uh, which translates epithemia, and, and it's really uh, a very intensive word. It's almost like the same word twice. And what Christ is saying here is, I really, really, really want to be at this table with you. And this is a massive moment because if you look at the words that follow, it's huge. Look at this. I need you to see this, that the knowledge of the intensity of the suffering that was about to come to Christ paled in comparison to the intensity at which he wanted to be with them. 
Look at the verse. It says, I want, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He knows what's coming, but what does he want to do? I want, I really, really want to be with you. And that brings us to our big idea today. Jesus wants you to come to the table. Jesus wants you to come to the table. And this is what the substitute is all about. Christ became our substitute for our sins so that we can commune with him directly. I want to look at two different ways that Christ was our substitute. Number one, I want to look at that Jesus was our bodily substitute. And secondly, Jesus was our blood substitute. So let's take that first one here. Jesus was our bodily substitute. He would be this final Passover lamb. The last one that would be necessary and here he is having this Passover with his disciples, this last meal, this one last foreshadowing, laying it down of what is to come to the men that love him the most. And look what it says here in verse 19. He says, and he took the bread and he'd, when, it, when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want to take a second to look at the element of bread here and see what Jesus is doing. He broke the bread, saying, this is my body given for you. Given for you. The word body is soma. It's this Greek word soma, which designates not just part of the body, not just half of the body, not just a piece of the body, the whole body body, the very physical person of Jesus was given for you. Jesus was our substitute with his body broken for us. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah written 700 years before this moment would have happened. And it says it this way, but he was wounded for our transgressions, our sins, our brokenness. He was bruised for our iniquities, again, our sin, our brokenness. The chastisement of our peace, the, the brokenness of our peace was upon him. And listen, with his stripes, we were healed. And I don't know what your traditions are at home, but around the Easter time, my family and I, we do something that I'll be honest with you is, is, is not incredibly enjoyable for me. We watch Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. And when it gets to this scene where Christ was broken for us, he was wounded, he was striped with a whip. I'll be honest with you, I, I can barely bear it. <laughs> but I need to see it. Because it reminds me that Jesus' body was broken for me. Both by the soldiers at his arrest and on the cross. And here's the truth of the matter. We don't think often enough about this detail. Why? Because it is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, and I know it. We only tend to think about it at Easter time, right? The crucifixion. Uh, may, maybe you don't know anything about crucifixion. It was actually invented about five, in, at about 500 B.C. by the Persians. They did it a little bit differently. They would take a tree of some sort about that big around, and they would basically sharpen the end of it. They would stick it through someone and hang it in the ground so they'd hang, and they'd hang it outside of cities. That was the first real form of crucifixion. Later on, the Romans would perfect it as not just a mode of execution, but a mode of torture. And it was deemed the most terrible way to die. The Greek philosopher Cicero said it this way, Roman citizens shouldn't even speak of the cross. It was that dastardly. Roman citizens weren't allowed to be crucified because it was that horrific. The Jews thought it was the most cursed of deaths. It was so horrific that a word didn't do it justice. They had to come up with something about it. 
That word today is the word we get excruciating, which literally means out of the cross. The body of Christ was broken and it was given for us. This is why, although it's uncomfortable to talk about, we need to remember. And why do we need to remember? Because through this, Jesus wants us to come to the table. So the first is Jesus was our bodily substitute. The second is Jesus was our blood substitute. Again, Jesus is at the table with his disciples. Look with me in Luke chapter 22, and he breaks the bread, and he takes the cup, and likewise the cup after he eaten, he said this, the cup that is poured out for you, this is the new covenant in my blood. There's a common misconception that goes around most often, I would say specifically in Christian circles, but, but maybe it's, it, it goes wider than that. And it's the idea that God does not hate anything. Unfortunately, that's a logical impossibility if we think about it. Is it true? Maybe you've even heard or repeated the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. That's not a biblical phrase that actually comes from a 1929 biography by Mahatma Gandhi. It wasn't Christ that said that. In fact, if you look at the Psalms, Psalms chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty thirsty and deceitful man. In fact, we don't have time to go through it all, but 14 times in the first 50 Psalms, we see God hates. Now, let me take a quick second to define hate here because he does this a couple times. Jesus even says to his disciples, you have to hate your mother and father, if you're going to follow me. This is a bit of hyperbole saying, listen, in comparison, your love for me has to look like hate. The difference here is God is 100% righteous and he can have nothing to do with unrighteousness. This is not an Old Testament thing. Some of you may be thinking that. It's a New Testament thing as well. Again, we don't have time to go through this all, but this is why the cup of Christ, the blood of Christ, which seems like such a morbid thing, might be so important. I said might. It is so important. In fact, I would assure you, it's a glorious thing. The blood of Christ was necessary to substitute our place to fulfill the wrath of God. Martin Luther so beautifully calls this the great exchange that our sin is justified in Jesus and his righteousness is imputed. It's given to me, my unrighteousness in exchange for his righteousness. Why? Why is the blood of Christ so important to talk about? Because it is in that blood, Jesus' blood, that he became the only possible substitute for me, for you. The blood of Christ, the beauty of the cross, is that when Jesus went to Calvary, he didn't just pay the price for my my lusting, my lying, my cheating, whatever sin you want to put on that list. Listen, he stood in my place. He took the holy hatred, the holy judgment, the holy wrath of God that was due us. He took it upon himself. Jesus stood in, in our place. So let us be careful and not lean on these careless cliches that make us comfortable. They sound good, but listen, they rob the power of the cross. Let's not do that. Jesus endured the penalty of sin. He took the place of sinners. John Stott put it best, and I love this. Listen to this quote. He says, The essence of sin is that man substitutes himself for God, but the essence of salvation is that God substitutes himself for man. 
Let me say that again. I, you got to listen to it, meditate on it. The essence of sin is that man substitutes himself for God. We want to be God so bad we can't. But the essence of salvation, the cup, the blood, is that God stood, he substituted in my place. Rather than condemning us, Jesus was condemned. Thanks be to God for that wondrous prophecy from Isaiah that was fulfilled in Christ, right? He was slaughtered in my place by his blood. I was made free. Why? Because Jesus wants you to come to the table. But we're not done yet. I, we got to finish out this passage. In fact, uh, I, the, the question I asked you is why the table, why the substitute of the blood, why the substitute of the body? But here's the, here's the kicker at the end. It's the application. What will I do with this? How will I respond? And I want to unpack this last portion here as we read the chapter 22 verse 21 he says behold the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table for the son of man goes it is as it has been determined but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed and they began to question one another of which of them it would be who was going to do this so christ finishes up he finishes up with a warning. As he's talking to his disciples, he's standing at this table right here. He breaks the bread, he drinks the cup. We're going to do that in a moment. But then he ends saying, Listen, one of you is going to be sitting here as betrayer, or one of you will be sitting here as friend. So I'm asking you this morning. How will you respond to Christ? Because he's inviting you. He earnestly, he really, really, really wants you to come to the table. Worship with us. Maybe you're sitting out there today wondering what this was all about. What is 
this about Jesus, this substitute? What, what are they singing about? Come to the table. And maybe you're even asking the question, who's eligible to come to the table? That's one of the things I love about this song we're singing. And let me put your mind at rest because as the song says, it's for the thief and the doubter. It's the hero, the coward, the prisoner, the soldier, for the young and for the older. Those who hunger, those who thirst, maybe you think you're last or maybe you think you're first. Paupers and princes, maybe you feel right now that you've failed, you've been forgiven. The chained, the free, maybe you're a follower, maybe you lead. If you're out there listening to this song, if you're out there listening to this message today, it's for you. And we wanna invite you to come to this table in the bonds of Jesus Christ and by his blood and resurrection, he is your substitute and all you have to do is nothing. Give him your life. So many out there, we wanna put things on a scale. If I do enough good, I can outweigh the bad. If I do this deed or if I do that deed, I can somehow win favor with God and there's nothing we can do. And in that, you would think there's despair. But in the bonds of Christ, it's glorious. He says, you can do nothing because I did everything. And so I want to invite you to accept him into your life today. And I, I want you to, to, to follow me in a prayer. And there's nothing special about this prayer. But it's invoking the name of Christ into your life. And he says, all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So today, if you're out there, bow with me. Repeat after me. Father, I'm a sinner. I'm wrong. And today, I repent. I turn away from my sin. And I give it to you, my substitute. Father, by your death and resurrection, you conquered my sin. And from this day forward, Father, I follow you. If that's you today, you now are in the precious fold of Jesus Christ. So come to the table. As we transition this moment into the table of communion, I want to invite all of you out there who maybe you bowed the knee this morning and gave your life to Christ. 
to come to this table as well, this remembrance. You now are welcome. We want to welcome you to join with us in communion, this remembrance of Christ. We also would like to invite you to please comment on our Facebook page or private message us so that we can communicate with you and help you in this journey. Come alongside you, as Christ said. We at this church are disciple makers. We're seeking to make disciples, as Christ said. So please make sure you inform us so we can help you. But join me this day. And I want to invite all followers of Christ to join us and partake together in this moment. I ask all of those of you who are out there, I know several of you are gathered in groups, to choose someone amongst you to distribute the elements as we go through. Hold them in your hand because we're going to partake together. But have someone in your home distribute those out, now, depending on what you brought, whether it's bread or crackers or juice or water, whatever the case may be, whatever you have in your home, we're asking you to partake in this remembrance with us today. A big part of communion is remembering and reflecting. Remember the sacrifice and promise that Jesus has made for us as we discussed today. It should involve so many things, but one of the elements is personal reflection. Paul says it's a time for a man to examine himself with the Lord and with others. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself. Before he eats of the bread, he drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So as we partake this morning, I want to take a second to reflect. Take a second to pray. I'm going to ask the band to continue playing. As I'm going to give you a moment as you're sitting there. Hopefully you've dispersed the elements. You're holding them. And we're going to pray together. I'm going to give you a moment of silence to pray to yourself. And then I'll pray with you and we'll partake together. Father, we come before you this morning understanding that this is no trite religious ritual, but a time to remember and honor our substitute, Jesus Christ, as he sat at that last Passover, the final Passover, as our substitute. And so, Father, I pray that as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do it in remembrance you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So let's start with the bread and we're just going to continue on with the scriptures we've read this morning. And it says in Luke chapter 22, and he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he distributed it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of him. Let's partake together in remembrance of him. Likewise, the scriptures teach us with the cup. After they had eaten, he said, this cup is poured out for you. The new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together in remembrance of him.
Again, I want to thank you for joining us today. And we want to invite you again to please comment in our sections. If you need anything, prayer, we want to help you with that. Typically, we invite people up front for prayer. Listen, this is no different. It's a digital era. Man, keep sending those prayer requests, those needs to us. We would love to help you in this time. Again, share this page with others. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in this digital era. Share the love of Christ with them. And as we go today, I just want to send you out with the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 4. And he says this, Finally, brothers, sisters, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is honorable, whatever is holy, whatever is just, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding be with you in this time by the power of Jesus Christ. May the peace of God be with you.